Children's Project, and her presentation is titled Shakespeare's Adaptation of Golding's Venus and Adonis from Narrative to Drama. Renell Bradley. Um, today I'm going to help you gain insight into one of the world's most gifted poets. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, Shakespeare is the only biographer of Shakespeare. When it comes to the life of William Shakespeare, there are many missing pieces or gaps that scholars have tried to fill. But here is what I can tell you. Around the early 1590s, his plays, The Comedy of Errors, Henry VI, Part 1, 2, and 3, were performed on at this point in his career, he was beginning to become an established playwright in London. However, in year 1593, an outbreak of the plague spread in London, and the theaters were temporarily closed. And so, does anyone know what our playwright does? Well, he writes and publishes a narrative poem called Venus in the Comics. This leads us to the question of why would a blossoming playwright at this point in his career, turn to a different form and write a narrative poem. Sure, previous scholars have mentioned that the closing of the playhouses due to the play practically pushed the playwright to write a poem. I mean, what else was he supposed to do, right? But let me offer you a different explanation, a far more complex one that provides new insight into our playwright, William Shakespeare. First, I will give you information about adaptation and the narrative poem itself. Then I will explore and analyze how Shakespeare dramatizes this poem. And finally, I will explain what this shows us about William Shakespeare himself. Let us begin by talking about adaptation theory. Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis was an adaptation of Ovid's myth, Venus and Adonis, and his Metamorphoses, written originally in Latin. When studying Shakespeare's narrative poem as an adaptation, I'm looking at it through the lens of Julie Sanders' adaptation theory. She views adaptation as much more complex than a simple linear movement from source to the new text or adopted text. She proposes to think of adaptation as more complex, like a process of a filtration system or terms of like intertextual fields or webs. This complex idea of the adaptation process becomes evident when we're looking at Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. There are two sources for his poem that scholars have debated. First, there's Ovid's original Latin, and then there's Arthur Golding's English translation of Ovid that was available during the time. Uh, for the purpose of this project, I'm gonna focus on Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid as a source. Um, while an analysis of Ovid's original Latin in comparison to Shakespeare's version should be done as well, for today I will focus on Golding's English translation due to the fact that beyond Shakespeare himself, his readership and his audience would have been highly familiar with Arthur, Arthur Golding's English translation. And even if they knew the original Latin, most likely they would have one eye on this English translation. So now that I've given you some background on adaptation theory, let me tell you the story of Venus and Adonis. The story I will tell you will be Arthur Golding's version. So Venus, the goddess of love, lusts after a young boy named Adonis. Adonis is really attractive and really handsome and he loves to hunt. Venus lusts after Adonis, and he finally gives it to her. But then she warns him to not go hunting. Of course, Adonis does not listen to her. Men never do. And he goes hunting anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, he then gets killed by a wild boar as he's hunting. Venus, in her grief, turns Adonis's blood into a flower, the anemone. Shakespeare, uh, in his narrative poem, writes his own adaptation of the story I just told you. A comparison of the two stories reveals that Shakespeare dramatizes Golding's narrative. How does he do this? Well, first of all, he invents more conflict to drive the plot. A great example of this is one of the major changes Shakespeare makes to the story, 
and it's quite hilarious. In Shakespeare's version, Adonis actively resists, resists Venus, the goddess of love. And not only does he do that, but he also chastises her for being extremely lustful. <laughs> Shakespeare also inserts dramatic irony to put the reader in the position of the playgoer. Uh, he enhances the emotional expression in the text, uh, creating more moments for elements such as dialogue and soliloquies. And he also adapts the text by pruning some hard to dramatize elements, such as the narrator and the stories within the stories that appear prominently in Golding's narrative. We have just discussed the ways that Shakespeare's adaptation of the story of Venus and Adonis is much more dramatic. But I must tell you, I am not the first scholar to realize this. <laughs> Previous scholars have related the dramatization of the story of this story to his plays, and some actually see this poem as a play. This is where I stray from other scholars. We must not forget that Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis is not a play, but a narrative poem. Shakespeare takes a non-dramatic poem of structure and add some dramatic flavor to it. Think of it like seasoning a piece of meat. When you add seasoning, meat may taste different, but it's still meat. The same applies here. This poem may taste dramatic, but it's still a narrative poem. In summary, we first looked at adaptation theory. Then we talked about Golding's version of Venus and Adonis in comparison with Shakespeare's version. And we found that Shakespeare's drama a story, creating a poem with dramatic flavor. So let us return to our earlier question. Why would our blossoming playwright at this point in his career turn to a different poem form and write a narrative poem? As I previously mentioned, there is the argument that since the theaters were closed, his desire to write plays found a release in this form. However, Another reason we must consider is the marginal social status of both the theater and playwright at this point in London, especially in comparison to other types of writing. Scott Macmillan writes, when Shakespeare first came to London and began to write for a living, he took up the least respectable, riskiest, and potentially most profitable medium Almost any kind of writing carried more steam than turning out scripts for the players in their new theaters. The narrative poem on a classical topic was one avenue to respectability. Perhaps, by writing this poem in the way that he did, Shakespeare intended to raise the status of the theater and of playwrights in the eyes of his noble patron and his other elite readers. In the closing of the theater, provided just the opportunity that he needed. Thank you. Thank you, Renelle. Do we have questions for Renelle? Well, I do. <laughs> okay, so um, I would like to know a little bit more about why Shakespeare takes the particular tone that you've explained is in this which is basically a kind of parodic tone, right? You know, he's making Venus, the goddess of love, into this kind of lustful creature who gets remonstrated by, um, by Adonis rather than immediately have, having her fall in love with him or having him fall in love with her, I should say. Obviously, normally Venus would simply be a, a, kind, of, uh, a kind of figure for a feeling, right? I mean, Venus is the goddess of love. If she appears before you, you're falling in love. So how, why is it that he creates this crazy situation where she's not <laughs> responded to in the way that she could? Well, um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think, well, first of all, it's very funny mm -hmm. to have the goddess of love be rejected. But also, I do think Shakespeare had in mind his readers at the time. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the Elizabeth, Elizabethan elite court culture. Um, they had a fascination with or they enjoyed some poems with homoeroticism in it. Um, this poem has some of that because, okay, Adonis is rejecting the goddess of love, Venus, so maybe he's not into women. Um, and that's why some people find it very funny. Um, and also he's feminized in the text. Um, uh, they describe his body, which is also kind of part of the time. 
Um, so yeah, I think Shakespeare knew what he was doing in a sense that it fit within the context of what his readership, his elite readership specifically, enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, and he was right because this poem was extremely popular. It was more popular than his sonnets. Um, it had six editions in the 1590s, and then I think it went to 10 editions, and then eventually, I want to say 16. Um, so this poem was extremely popular and enjoyed by the court. Mm -hmm. Highly successful. Would this be the same audience that was going to the plays, or would it be like slightly different? Or, yeah, would it great question. It differently. <laughs> great question. So, yeah. So I'm going to generalize, but the audience um, at his plays in London, in the Globe, that weren't performed at the court, um, would not have been the elite culture that I'm talking about that's reading his poems. And so that fits into part of my argument is. Okay, maybe he's writing a poem to appeal to this higher elite audience to gain more respect and esteem. Because this audience that he wrote the poem to, so people who were a part of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth's court, um, upper class, nobility. Thank you, that's what I was saying. I need it. Um, those were people reading his poems. Maybe going to his plays, some of his plays are played in the court, so that gets a little blurry and complicated, but uh, people going to his plays. So yeah, there's a difference, and that kind of helps my argument make sense. Do we have other questions for now? Yeah. I was wondering where this falls into his other like works, like what um, we do around this time, what else, like what plays? Okay, so the plays um, he did, so The Comedy of Errors, Henry VI, Part 1, 2, and 3, I can tell you he did before this poem. After that, the dates get kind of blurry, so I don't want to kind of tell you that. And then, but then you can say the, once the theaters closed, this poem came out. Also, the Rape of Lucrece came out. Rape of Lucrece came out after this one. It's a narrative poem as well. And then after that, I want to say the Sonnets came out, and then more plays came out. Um, so this is earlier, a little bit earlier in his career, and I guess.